Friday, May the 24th, in the year of our Lord, 2024. I'm Pastor Tom Baker, and you're listening to Law and Gospel. Yesterday, uh, with Wes Reimnitz, uh, we talked about a very interesting subject, and we want to continue with another email we received. This one is from Robin Schumacher. And he starts with something I was not quite as aware of as maybe some of you are. He says, I'm sure you are as shocked as I am to hear that legalized sports betting is chocked full of corruption. What? A thing to think of. According to a Wall Street Journal article about a month ago, less than six years after the Supreme Court opened the door for states to embrace legalized sports betting, major U.S. leagues are already confronting the darker sides of sports betting with alarming frequency. At the heart of the problem is the population whose ability to bet on sports is the most severely curbed for athletes themselves. The report goes on to say, that the betting landscape has, quote, seen players across the major professional and college leagues drawn into a building avalanche of gambling scandals that show just how perilous the new landscape has become. Now, I personally have never been involved in sports betting. That's where you you go talk to somebody and you make a bet saying that this basketball team, for example, will win over the other team by at least eight points. And if you make that goal and you win it, then you win the bet. So, you know I like watching YouTube. And they had a documentary talking about a young man who played football. He was a quarterback. And he got involved in owing money in gambling. And the people came to him and said, we'll get rid of your debt if your football team only wins by five points. And, of course, he didn't want to do that, but he knew he owed a lot of money. And so he played the game in such a way that though they won, they would only win by five points. That's an example of how in this particular school that happened. Now, both the NFL, National Football League, and the NBA, National Basketball Association, are replete with examples And during this year's March Madness, the biggest sports betting event in America, the Temple University men's basketball team was flagged by prominent gambling watchdog from the U.S. Integrity for suspicious wagering activity on its own games. So, 
Robin Shoemaker says, it sure seems like something is in us drawing to make wages. Do just a little digging into the psychology of gambling, and you'll find a lot of research that talks about pleasure-seeking, escapism, and greed, all of which form a potent combination that makes for a powerful addiction. In fact, we have our own example in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, where a pastor's wife was using money that had been set aside for the college education of their children and was gambling with it. Of course, as is common, she lost everything with which she was gambling. So her husband did not know that she was using the account for the college education for her gambling addiction. She committed suicide. That's how strong gambling can become. I knew I had a Sunday school teacher and her sister would often go to Las Vegas in the old days. They would fly you down there, give you a hotel room, also some food to eat at their banquets, and all that was for about $100. Now, they expected people who would get that trip to gamble away maybe thousands of dollars. But my Sunday school teacher and her sister set aside $100 to gamble with while they were there for three days. And as soon as that $100 was gone, they stopped gambling. So they had great meals, great hotel room, great airport transportation, but did not spend much at all. It's not unusual if people go to a baseball game, let's say a father and mother take their two children, that after paying to get into the game, depending on where they sit, and buying popcorn and soda, etc., it's not at all unusual that they spend 50 to $60 in one day just by going to a baseball or football game. In fact, we were told that there were seats being sold for the March basketball game that were going for over $1,000 a seat. So, It seems like, as Robert Schumacher says, there is within human nature, in a fallen state, the desire to make money without much effort. And gambling is seen by a lot. I mean, how many times in a movie do you see somebody who owes a lot of money to those that he or she borrowed money from in order to do gambling and were unable to win much. And then they would say, well, I'm going to try again because I know I can make money by going to the casino or do sports betting. And, of course, they lose even more. But as bad as the damage 
from gambling can be in this life. Robert Schumacher says, there's another bet that many make about God that's infinitely and eternally worse. He says it's captured well by the philosophical argument called Pascal's Wager, which he thinks is often misunderstood and abused. So both sides of the religious divide have problem with it. Frenchman Blase Pascal, he was known for many things. He was a mathematician, a physicist, philosopher, and theologian. Now, before his death, Pascal had started writing a book that he wanted to be a defense of the Christian faith. Now, he never finished it, but others assembled his drafts and organized them into a book that's entitled Pensées in French, which means thoughts. And entry number 233 is known as Pascal's Wager, which is an argument that he aimed at the vast majority of his friends who were not Christians. Most who heard of it and are asked to describe what Pascal meant generally say something like this. If you're going to choose between belief in God and not, it's a smarter wager to believe in God. Because if he exists, you gain everything. And if he doesn't, you've lost nothing. Well, nobody likes this explanation, and for good reason. The skeptic argues that putting your belief in something blindly because you might benefit in the end is a poor way to think and live. And they are right in thinking that. The Christian points out that simply choosing to believe that God exists without any faith in Christ and being born again is not saving faith. Remember the argument that Jesus gave with Nicodemus? You need to be born again. He couldn't figure how he could get back in his mother's womb. But Jesus was talking about by baptism, by the Holy Spirit. You see, it is impossible for one who is an unbeliever to make a decision by their free will to believe in Jesus Christ. He needs to receive faith from the Holy Spirit. And what is that faith? It is trust in the promises of Jesus Christ. So you may have a lot of philosophers who try and prove that God exists. And if you'll take a look at the scripture, for example, in Romans 1, it kind of makes a point that when you take a look at creation, it is obvious that a God exists because it's impossible for the world to be as it is without a maker or a creator. And so some people may say 
boy, when I look at the universe, I see that God exists. But that doesn't prove that Christ exists. It doesn't help anybody to know that he died on the cross for your sins. So, Pascal's wager is a flop in being a good argument for God. There may be some merit in it, but not in the traditional sense, as most think about it. The gist of his argument begins a little way down in his text and starts with, God is or he is not. To which side shall we incline? Now, Pascal, being a good Christian, says that reason can decide nothing here. In fact, remember when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus and convinced two disciples why he had to die on the cross and be raised from the dead. Jesus only used the scriptures, the Old Testament, from Genesis through Malachi. He didn't use reason because reason doesn't convince anyone to believe that Jesus is their Savior. What convinces them, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, is the gift of the Holy Spirit that creates faith in us. So, reason can decide nothing. There's an infinite chaos that separates us from God. A game is being played at the extremity of this infinite distance where heads or tails will turn up. What will you wager? According to reason, you can do neither the one or the other because neither of them can defend the proposition. Remember that Pascal is writing to his skeptical friends during a historical period of the world when the Enlightenment was getting ready to kick off. Non-Christians during this period, as well as today, argued that the Christian believes by faith. But they, in contrast, believe things only because of reason and proof. But there is no proof or evidence to show that Jesus is your Savior or that his death on the cross forgave your sins. We do not say that there is evidence outside the Bible. Only the words of the Bible provide the evidence or proof that Jesus is your Savior. Reason can decide nothing here. So, during the Enlightenment, when people were trying to use evidence, it didn't work. We believe because that's what faith gives us. Pascal says, sorry, according to reason, you can defend neither of the propositions. 
while the Christian cannot definitely prove God exists, the non-Christian cannot positively rule him out, either based on empirical evidence. In other words, the charge usually leveled at Christians by skeptics of what's the proof for your position can easily be turned back with, and what's the proof for your position? Thus, Pascal says, both the Christian and non-Christian are waging their lives on faith commitments. Everyone is, in a sense, on a religious path. So, how does one get on the right path? It's obvious that the unbelievers are not on the right path because apart from faith in Christ, every one of their decisions, even to do good works, they're always based on selfishness, like What's in it for me? And therefore, Pascal's wager about believing in God because you can gain everything and not believing in God, you lose nothing, really doesn't make any sense. Not to the unbeliever. He doesn't want to have faith in faith. The Christian also agrees that I'm not saved because I have faith. No, I'm saved because my faith believes that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. And that's the message of every sermon. Pascal answers briefly that Christianity does enjoy a cumulative case for God when he writes, is there no means of seeing the faces of the cards? Yes, they're found in scriptures. He says, if you study Christian Bible for any length of time, you know through the power of the Holy Spirit that the historicity of the Bible and the rest of its theology adds up pretty quickly and provides solid footing for those who believe in Jesus Christ. That said, even though Pascal was assembling content for a Christian defense of the faith, he hints that those pieces of evidence don't necessarily unlock the door to the true God on their own. Instead, he says the path to God for the unbeliever involves First, answering the question, what is really holding them back from belief? Pascal believed the answer to that involved a person understanding their specific motivations for unbelief and not by an increase of proofs of God. Instead, when a person is confronted with the scripture, they are led to what is called the statement of your passions, that worldly things are loved and practiced, and an acknowledgement of them is a primary obstacle to believing in Jesus Christ. 
So what about a third option? Those who claim they're Switzerland on the subject, neutral, unwilling to make a decision either way. Pascal says, sorry, you're in the game whether you want to be or not. You say the true course is not to wager at all, but you must wager. It is not optional. You are embarked because the human being only can be saved, not by neutrality, but by believing the Bible's evidence from its scripture words that Jesus is your Savior. So if you're a Christian reading this, give thanks for taking the time that the Spirit unlocked the world you difference from your Asco's wager. Well, that is one through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God and thanks be to Christians in sharing that message with others. I'm Tom Baker. We're not going to be here on Monday because of the holiday. We'll be back on Tuesday. God bless you. Listen to Law & Gospel each weekday morning at 9.30 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law & Gospel, please make your check out to Law & Gospel and mail to Law & Gospel P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri, 63132, or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962. Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.